Okay, here we are, four o'clock. Welcome back to your favorite class. Yes. Okay, baby. Today's topic, we're going to finish area moments of inertia. We kind of left off at the very tail end of last class, working through an example problem. We'll finish that up today. And then we'll move on to mass moments of inertia, which is a different sort of geometric property of a material that um, has a similar name and similar variable, capital I, but two completely different things. So there you go. Uh, course announcements, uh, simulation one due right now. It's four o'clock. If you didn't get it in, you know, sad, sad panda. All right. Homework number three coming soon on area moments of inertia. We're going to finish the topic today. I pretty much put the homework together. It's only going to be three problems. Um, I don't want to, you know, give you too much over the break, but um, I envision uh, kind of three problems for area moments of inertia and uh, probably be due the Tuesday that you get back. All right. So look for that probably coming tomorrow. How about that? Uh, how about that bicycle? What do we think of that bike, bike there? That would be an uncomfortable ride, I think. More of the story. Don't round up your pie to four. Or else you have to take a ride on that thing. <laughs> I was telling these guys, I think there's like a Mythbusters episode where they like get a car and put square wheels on it and like drive it around. It's pretty funny. <laughs> it's pretty good. Okay. Let us pick up where we left off then. Okay. Here we are. So we were making our way through this kind of complicated example. In this example, we were looking at what is the area moment of inertia of this object about axes through this object's centroid. So pretty much pulling everything together up to this point that we sort of talked about. So centroids of a composite object, which we've kind of gone through already for this problem. We're going to do area moments of inertia for a composite object, which will utilize a uh, parallel axis theorem. So complicated, um, but we can do it. We're all right. So we were kind of making our way through um, the centroid of this object. We were defining using our traditional centroid equations, which is the summation of the centroids of the individual objects multiplied by their individual areas, normalized by the summation of their areas, will give us the centroid of the object in both X and Y. So we had kind of made our way through that by defining all the sort of pieces of interest for these various objects, object one and object two, both sort of rectangular objects. And gone through our summations here to figure out that the location of my centroid in this particular object, x bar, y bar, was 2.7, 3.9. All right, so that's about where we left off. And um, this wasn't really a lecture on centroids, but it was something that we needed to do for this problem so that we could sort of establish the area moments of inertia about the centroid. So let's kind of pick up then with where we left off. And let's now move on to what is kind of like the next portion of this problem and sort of where we start to bring in area moments of inertia for this particular guy. And I'll just remind you by bringing up the problem statement, what that kind of is. And we've gone through step one and step two already. Centroid of the small bodies, centroid of the composite bodies. Now the next step is that we want to calculate the area moment of inertia of each of those smaller bodies about its own centroid. All right, so let's do that. So area moments of inertia of small bodies. Okay. And last lecture, we talked about using direct integration to calculate these area moments of inertia for sort of like strangely shaped objects, right? But we're kind of graduated from that now. And if we have objects that are relatively simple, like these rectangles, then we can just go to a table and take those values off now. All right. Just like, you know, if you have standard centroids of a composite object, you go to a table, find out what the centroid is and use that in your calculation. All right. So um, we're kind of at the point now where we're just going to pull um, the area moments of inertia of these various bodies off of tables. And so you can go into your notes and check what the area moment of inertia is for various objects about their centroids. There's tables online. There's tables in your book. You can get those all over the place. And here we have a couple of rectangles that more or less we're going to look at. You know, if you've got that full rectangle of the full body and the hollow rectangle sort of in the middle. And you see here that the area moments of inertia about X and Y utilize the dimensions of the rectangle H and B. B is the base, H is the height. Okay. And about the X axis, which is sort of this X centroidal axis, we have 1 12th BH cubed. And about the Y axis, we have 1 12th HB cubed, or B cubed H sometimes written. So we're gonna utilize that general formula to calculate the area moments of inertia of these individual objects. All right. So let's do that now. So for object one, 
which is kind of like the larger rectangle. We're going to have the, the area moment of inertia, I, about the x-axis for object number one. And specifically, we're doing the centroidal area moment of inertia. And so anytime we do a centroidal area moment of inertia, I like to put a bar over the top of it, just so we kind of know that it's a centroidal area moment of inertia. So I'm going to do that here. This is equal to 1 12th B1 H1 cubed. This is just a standard formula from that table. And I'm specifying here the subscript one for each of these guys to know that we're dealing with object number one. So if we go back up here and uh, sort of remember our dimensions for this problem, I know it's kind of been two whole days, uh, but the base of this guy is 0.9 plus two plus 2.1, which is five inches. And the height of this guy <clears throat> here is five plus 1.2 plus 1.8, which is gonna be eight inches. So we can plug those values into here and actually calculate our area of inertia of this guy about X axis directly. As 1 12th, the base, which is 5 inches, multiplied by the height, which is 8 inches cubed. All right, so punch this in. Remember, our units are inches to the fourth. This will be 213.3 inches to the fourth. All right, similar procedure for the area moment of inertia of this guy about the y-axis. Similar looking equation, 1 12th B1 cubed H. Just like rotating this guy 90 degrees, you're just going to basically switch which variable becomes the base, quote unquote. <clears throat> so here we'll get 1 12th uh, this base, which is 5 inches cubed, multiplied by the height to the first power, which is 8 inches. Punch this into your calculator to 83.3 inches to the fourth. Or if you're really good at mental math, maybe, I don't know. I don't want to say punch this into your calculator. I know some of you guys went to the MIT derivative off and you can just crush it. So um, anybody watch that video, by the way? <laughs> Man, uh, nobody's interested. All right. Well, it's it's amazing. You know, someone someone had a calc midterm that took priority. Well, you could have learned by watching the derivative off. So you could have killed two birds with one stone. Like, come on. All right. For object number two about its centroid, we're going to need the dimensions of object number two. So let's scroll back up here and remind ourselves what those are. So here we have a height for this internal object, which is the hollow rectangle, five inches, and a width here of that hollow rectangle of two inches. And remember, we're kind of doing it about its centroidal axis, which remember is like this axis here that I just highlighted in blue. All right. So um, the centroidal axis is going to be here, 1 12th, same equation, bh cubed, except we'll use the dimensions of the inner guy. Uh, here at the base of this guy, two inches. Multiplied by the height of this guy, which is five inches cubed. Do your mental math. 20.8 inches to the fourth. And finishing this off. Uh, same general equation here. 1 12th b2 cubed h2 1 12th 2 inches to the third times 5 inches giving us here an area moment of inertia about the y-axis 3.3 inches to the fourth okay so these are all of your area moments of inertia of those various objects about their own centroid now, the problem asks us to calculate the total area moment of inertia of these guys about those axes, um, but not about their, their own centroids. We want it about the centroid of the whole object. All right, so let's make a nice little sketch here again where we sort of just really hammer home what's happening. Because in order to go from the centroids of those individual objects to calculating the centroid, you know, the area moments of inertia about the whole object, we need to use the parallel axis theorem which allows us to describe what effect each individual object has on an axis that is not necessarily aligned with its centroid. So we need to make that transformation here. All right, so let's make our sketch of our piece again so I don't have to keep going up and down. I'll just make a new picture here and I'll do my best to really highlight some of the information that we've already calculated here and show some of the information that we need to utilize the parallel axis theorem correctly. All right, so if we just generally make a sketch of like what's going on here. 
sort of exaggerating this just uh, generally a little bit. We have our X axis here. We have our Y axis. Now I want to highlight the area, um, the general centroids that we've calculated. So we know like for object number one here, uh, this guy has a centroid which is at 2.5 inches and 4 inches. So this general dimension is 5. This general dimension is 8, just a reminder. So if we're looking at object number 1, right smack dab in the center there, is our centroid for object number 1. And we know this is generally at location like x tilde 1, y tilde 1, which we calculated previously and is pretty easy just to see by the image, 2.5, 4 in inches. This object has axes associated with its centroid, and I'm going to highlight those here. And I'm going to call these or label these like X1 and X2 just for discussion purposes. Uh, sorry, X1 and Y1. All right. Object number two, we also found where that centroid is. And that was at a location 1.9 comma 4.3. So I'm going to put that in here. And um, maybe this isn't the best drawing because it's displaced slightly above here. Kind of exaggerating this as much as I can here. I know this isn't maybe properly exact, but it'll prove my point. The centroid of this second object here was at x tilde 2, y tilde 2. And we calculated this last time as 1.9 comma 4.3 inches. All right. So we see that the centroid of this particular object slightly above object number 1 and slightly to the left of object number 1. I'll put some axes on here as well because they're going to be important to us for the remainder of the problem. Here, this is y2, and this is x2. <clears throat> now, lastly, we calculated the centroid of this composite object. And maybe it's a little bit clearer now since I've sort of exaggerated some of the pictures where that's going to go. And we'll remind ourselves what that centroid actually was. So for this composite object, we calculated X bar and Y bar as 2.7 and 3.9, bad two. All right. So if I think about where this is gonna be in relation to let's say this guy, slightly to the right, and where it's gonna be in relation to this guy slightly below. All right, so I think the centroid of my object being slightly to the right and slightly below, this probably, you know, exaggerating a little bit again, is the approximate location of the centroid of the composite. And it sort of makes sense. Like if you thought about, you know, the centroid of the main object is, is here, and then we hog out a bunch of material to the left and above that, that would move our centroid of this general object down and to the right. If you remove a bunch of material up into the left, you'll move the centroid down into the right. If you just think about like that centroid equation, that's that's generally what's going to happen. Okay, so let's put some axes on here. It's getting a little busy here, I know, but going to be important. And let's call these the centroidal axes, and we'll label it with x prime, y prime. All right, and these are your centroidal axes. Now, what I want to do is. Ultimately, I want to find this i x prime and i y prime, right? That's what I want for this object. And I know things like the individual area moments of inertia about the x-axis and y-axis of the individual pieces, and I know the distances between the centroidal axes of each individual piece and the centroidal axis of the whole body, right? I can use then the parallel axis theorem to get me there. And let's remind ourselves what that parallel axis theorem is. 
So let's put that into words. We have area moment of inertia of all objects and distance between axes. Like we've calculated all that, right? So then use parallel axis theorem, not point after touchdown. <clears throat> parallel axis theorem. To get something like my area moment of inertia about the X prime axis is the summation of the individual contributions of the pieces. So we wrote this last time. It's the centroidal axis about X of object I plus the area of the individual object I multiplied by the distance between the two axes of interest squared. And remember that when we're looking at the area moment of inertia about the X prime axis, which is here, the parallel axis theorem utilizes the distance between the axis of interest and the axis that I'm going to. And so for us, if we're looking at, let's say the centroid of the body, which is this X prime, and its distance to the centroid of object number one, for instance, we're looking at this particular distance. So if I'm using the parallel axis theorem to sort of see what contribution I'm getting from object one about the X prime axis, then the distance between X prime and X one is this vertical distance. That can be a little confusing because we're looking at the distance between like this X prime and this X one axis, which is a vertical distance, but we're going between X axes. So it's a little bit sort of confusing. Um, and so maybe you can give yourself some label on the variable D here to make sure that you know that this is a vertical distance. Um, maybe we could call this something like D between X I and X prime. Maybe that's helpful because it's kind of telling you between which axes you're looking at. Maybe that will be like helpful for you. Similar thing with the Y prime axis. We're summing the individual contributions of the individual objects area moment of inertia about the Y axis plus the area of that particular object multiplied by the distance between that object and the axis of that object and the axis of the composite body. It's DI squared. So we have the same sort of concept here occurring where we're looking at what is the area moment of inertia about the Y prime axis? And we have to consider the distance between the Y prime axis and the Y axis of object I. That is this distance here. So you may want to think of this as like D, Y, I, and Y prime, all right? The distance between the Y, I axis and the Y prime axis, which is actually a horizontal distance despite like this variable Y. So if I were to kind of like go up to my picture and visualize what that might be, if I was looking at, let's say, the distance between Y prime and Y I, that is a horizontal distance, which you would label this D here, all right? All right, so let's actually bang out what those horizontal distances are, and then we can utilize our equation, all right? So let's find D values. And maybe we can utilize our sort of naming scheme here to really help us be very clear about this. All right, so let's first start with D X one X prime. It's the distance between the X one axis and the X prime axis. Well, that here is, I'll write this first and then I'll explain it. Y tilde one minus Y bar. All right, it's the vertical distance between those two axes. Remember Y tilde one is the centroidal location of object one. And Y bar is the centroidal location of the composite object. So the vertical distance between the X prime axis and the X one axis is just the change in the Y dimension between those two objects. All right. So here 
this we've got all these values. We know the vertical centroidal location of object number one is four inches. I'm going to subtract the vertical location of the centroid Y bar, which is 3.9 inches. And here this will give me 0 0.1 inches. All right, we can continue this idea. The distance between axis Y1 and Y prime is going to be a horizontal distance, which is the distance between the X location of object one and the centroidal X location of the composite body. All right. So if I sort of wanted to visualize what this is again between um, Y1 and Y prime, I can sort of make my way up here. Y1 and Y prime. I know my X coordinate here. This is like the coordinate X bar and the coordinate here is X tilde one. So I'm just looking at the difference between those two points. All right, so I have these also calculated as 2.5 inches minus 2.7 inches. Or negative 0.2 inches. Did that in my head. Proud of me? It matters zero. The question is, does the negative make a difference? And since we're squaring the value, it does not make a difference. The contribution to the total area moment of inertia of the object doesn't matter whether you displace to the left or to the right of the axis, you're still going to have that same general additional contribution. All right, let's look at the second object. Between the X2 axis and the X prime axis, that distance will be Y tilde 2 minus Y bar. It's this vertical height of that hollow um, rectangle. This here is 4.3 inches. Minus my centroid of my composite object, which is 3.9 inches. So this is 0 0.4. Finally, the distance between the Y2 axis and the Y prime axis will be X tilde 2 minus X bar. X tilde 2 is the X location of the centroid of the hollow rectangle. Here that's 1.9 inches. Minus the centroidal location of the composite object is 2.7 inches. So pretty, pretty far displaced here, negative 0 0.8 inches. And you could, you know, reverse all of these subtractions to get the distance. It's irrelevant, right? You're going to flip the negative signs, but it doesn't matter because we're going to end up squaring that value. All right, now I'm ready to rock, finally. I'd say like this section is just the most treacherous for students. It's, just killer because you're you're talking about a distance between an X and an X prime axis, which is actually a Y distance. And it's just it really is. I've seen a lot of people just implode at that location. All right, but ready. We're f finally ready here. All said and done, my area moment of inertia, my composite body about the centroidal X prime axis. Here is my summation of the individual components plus the area of the individual components multiplied by their distances between the axis of the individual object and the axis of the centroid of the object. So here I'll just work it all out. We have all these numbers. You can sort of reference things above. So for object one, the area moment of inertia about its own centroidal X axis. We calculated this before, it's 213.3 inches to the fourth. Plus the area of object one we calculated uh, on Tuesday. It's just eight times five inches, so 40 inches squared. Multiplied by the square of the distance between uh, the X1 axis and the X prime axis, which we've calculated above as 0.1 inches. And don't forget to square this. Always good to check my units are matching. Here's inches to the fourth. Here's inches squared times inches squared. I'm going to have inches to the fourth both situations. That's nice. 
I'm going to subtract the contribution of the hollow rectangle. Area moment of inertia of object number two about the x axis. 20.8 inches to the fourth. Adding to that the area of the second object, which is 2 times 5 is 10 inches squared, multiplied by the distance between x2 and x prime, which is this like dx prime x2 value, which is 0 0.4 inches. Don't forget your square. All right, you can work all this out. You find that the area moment of inertia about the centroidal axis of the composite object x prime is going to be 191.3 inches to the fourth. If you're working through some problem like this, which has got a, like a lot of calculation, you might want an easy way to check your answer. SolidWorks, I'm telling you. If you can model that, that cross section in SolidWorks and go to the section properties of SolidWorks, bam, there you go. Tell you about the centroidal axis. You can put a reference coordinate system in there if you want. I'll tell you the area moment of inertia about that reference. It's actually quite nice. That's how I checked this answer, actually. All right, similar idea for this y prime axis. Area moment of inertia of object one about its y axis is 83.3 inches to the fourth, plus the area of object one, 40 inches squared multiplied by the distance between um, the y1 and the y prime axis. We found this to be negative 0 0.2 inches. So I'll include that here, even though it's rather irrelevant because we're squaring this to Caleb's point. Um, I'm going to subtract the contribution of the hollow. This one had a rather low area moment of inertia about its own y axis. plus the area of object two, multiplied by the distance that this object is away from the y prime axis in the x direction, negative 0 0.8 inches to the fourth. Sorry, inches squared. Okay, there we go. All said and done. Punch this in 75.2 inches to the fourth. All right, a lot going on in this problem. I wouldn't ask you anything like this on a test. There's just too many steps. One thing goes wrong, it all explodes. But I like this problem, even though it kind of took us a while, because it brings everything together we've talked about the last two weeks, basically. You've got centroids, you got parallel axis theorem, you got composite bodies, you got all this crazy stuff going on, and it brings it all together. And some kind of like fun, interesting calculations. All fun for me. Um, so that's going to wrap up area moments inertia. I actually think we'll break here since it kind of seems like a natural break. Um, let's pick it up at 4.38 and we'll go to the end. New topic. So break, come back at 4.38.
You have death roll. Four plus. Go four. Oh. Oh, you don't even need to study. You, you did double no water rolls already. What are you doing? <laughs> Okay. Do it is. So what do you need to study for? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. You guys doing the same? Like you're doing partial, partial integrals too? What's that? Yeah, yeah, three tests. Um, but you're just like doing partial integrals or partial derivatives. Yeah. Not that bad. Well, are you doing like curl divergence, etc., yet or not? Like Dell operator, does that mean anything to you? No. no? Okay. Well, pretty much just all the different types of derivatives. Okay. Yeah. Okay. When you get to the Dell operator, try not to curl it. Okay. It's not that bad, or right? but. <laughs> Yeah, it's not that bad. Yeah, here's your here's your Dell operator. Not bad. You got eggs, you getting old? What's that? You got eggs, you getting old? I am? Oh, I thought you said you woke up and like. Oh, no, I said like last week when we were sleeping back, probably like Wednesday or something, I woke up and my whole body was asleep. <laughs> like, I don't know what was going on, I probably got hit by a truck. That's not a good sign. <laughs> I think that's like, isn't that one of the signs of COVID? Like when you, you like just feel very weak and. I don't know. <laughs> a lot of like the next day I felt, I didn't feel like that anymore. Yeah. Huh. I never got a fever or nothing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's crazy because. When I was younger, I was like always doing athletic stuff. Like I played ultimate frisbee in college, and I was a CrossFit coach for a couple, like multiple years. And now I'm 33, and I wake up and I'm like, my back hurts every day, like constantly, like my back. I'm just like, oh, why is it always got like this dull, ache? like a level two out of ten pain constantly, it's like always there. And I gotta like stretch and like. It's just like, oh, my body's like falling apart. I'm 30. I'm like, God damn. I feel old. <laughs> How old are you, Jess? Almost 22. Almost 22, yeah. Okay. So you'll, you'll, you'll get there eventually. I didn't know since you had been like working as you were older. I only worked for two or three weeks. Okay, yeah. Interesting that you would pick MSOE then. If you were up in like the Green you were in like the Green Bay area, right? Yeah, I was I applied to the WGB because I got a grant funding grant program. Then I was a guy I was working with, he's like, Why did you waste your time there? And I'm like, Well the MSOE is better. And then I looked online and there was no essay or nothing like that. I'm serious. And I filled it out. I was just gonna tell him I got in and all of a sudden I'm like, Oh, 
Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm sure you would get it. Your education would be perfectly good if you, if you went there, you know? I'm sure. I think the quality here is probably slightly better, but it's, you know, like nine out of 10 versus eight out of 10 or something, you know? Like, I, I don't know that other program very well, but I can't imagine it's like hugely different. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really know either. I heard good things about the school, though. So yeah. I guess it just kind of depends on what you want. I think, like, UWGB would also probably have, like, smaller class sizes. Maybe. Maybe. The program was worse. I don't think they were accredited. Oh, yeah. Oh, if they're not credited, then. That's why I was kind of thinking. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah, you don't want to go there, then. You don't have an ABET accredited engineering degree. Yeah, you might as well have a piece of paper with your name on it that said I achieved engineering. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, that's what part of the reason I left the Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it would have been nice to stay close to home because then I could have worked. Yeah. Home would have been easier to work, but now I'm going to do it remotely and drive home. Oh, Eau, Eau Claire's not too far from you, is it? Eau Claire? I mean, it's like, is that equal it's distance from Milwaukee? Oh, uh, it's a little longer than Milwaukee? Yeah, Milwaukee's only, I can get from here to my house in an hour or three or five. Oh, that's not bad at all. No. Why did I think that it was, like, farther than that? I don't know. It's a dead straight shot. Yeah. Yeah, sure. You need that. It's not too bad, then. I thought it was, I thought yeah. it was longer drive than that. Yeah, yeah, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, I was doing consulting when I, between a couple summers ago, I was doing consulting, living in Milwaukee and doing the consulting job on the west side of Madison. And that took about like an hour 20 to get there. And I was going there like three times a week, which is just annoying. But you just put on the podcast and you just you know let it ride. Yeah, a lot of gas. I mean, they're paying me pretty well, so that was nice. But unfortunately for you, it's not 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 much you can do there. Okay, let's uh let's get back to it then. Four thirty eight, as advertised. Gave you a break a little early, so no sleeping. Rawr. Okay, I see uh, we got the uh, cola going here in class, so it's nice. Yeah, <laughs> um, right, so let's get into it. New topic, and we're going to talk now about mass moments of inertia. We'll stay with the inertia trend. You could say we have a lot of inertia going in inertia. All right. So I posted um, new slides for this. I, I actually kind of want to pull up the first slide of the new notes because I think it's just kind of an interesting picture. And I think a lot of people talk about this or just like generally might know that this is true, um, but don't really understand the math behind it. It's like if you're a, if you're a figure skater, um, maybe you are, uh, you would understand that if you're spinning around and your extremities are out, your legs, your arms, et cetera, or, or you have a lot of mass away from your central axis of rotation, then you will generally spin slower, given the same sort of like momentum energy, than if you sort of like tuck your arms or bring your arms into your center of your body and your legs into your center of your body, you'll spin faster. And it doesn't have anything to do with providing additional torque because, you know, you can sort of do this if you're already spinning, bring your arms into the center of your body, you will spin faster, bring them out to the edge of your body, you will spin slower. It doesn't have anything to do with providing additional torque as you spin around. It's just a property or a result of some of this. We're, we're doing it here on the chairs in the, in the classroom. Uh, <laughs> I like your experimental nature, um, but it doesn't have anything really to do with additional torque or additional forces that are that are acting. It all has to do with sort of a property of your body, which is the mass moment of inertia. And so the first thing I want to start with, and the first thing I like to start this lecture off with is asking you guys, what is the definition of mass? Like, what do you guys, what do you guys think of when, when you're asked, what is the definition of mass? Anyone got any, like, anything they want to try to rattle off for that? Pretty hard to, like, just come up with it in, like, a succinct sentence, right? 
<laughs> a measure of the quantity of atoms. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's getting to like a very physical chemi chemistry kind of perspective. But yeah, you can relate like moles of particles in an object to, you know, a mass, but different for each element because they all have sort of different um, atomic numbers. But yeah, I like that idea. I like where you're going with that. I want it in kind of like a, a mechanics term or a mechanics thought. Like when we think about mass or think about that kind of idea in this class, what equation that we see very often contains mass? Say it louder. F equals ma. Yeah. And so I want to talk about that journal equation and what 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 we might consider in like the mechanics world to be a nice definition of mass. All right. So let's uh, take that idea and run with it, and it will be an analogy that leads us into what we define or how we sort of define the mass moment of inertia. So let's first just like consider a box that's sliding on ice. Uh, kind of a good analogy right now. Is the, is the river frozen over yet? I wonder. Is partially frozen? Yeah, okay. So, real, <laughs> okay. Yeah, a bunch of geese standing on it. Okay, so go out to the frozen river and push a goose. Okay, and see what happens. This is this is the analogy you want to go with here. Geese are kind of jerks, so maybe it's fun to do. All right, so let's consider this situation. Consider a box of mass M sliding on ice. And the reason I say on ice is because we want like a frictionless surface. All right, here's your box, bam. All right, and it's got some mass at the center here. Let's call it little m, all right. The acceleration of this box is governed by F equals ma. Obviously. So if I think about like drawing a sort of a schematic of how this looks, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, I'm applying some force F, and that's going to give me some acceleration on this guy, which looks like MA. We'll talk about diagrams that look like this in the future. You've seen free body diagrams, and we're going to talk about kinetic diagrams, which is sort of the right-hand side of this equation in the future. But for now, let's just assume that is true. So if we think about this, and we were to like rearrange for mass, you would get that the mass is the force divided by the acceleration. So this might be one definition that you would use to describe like what is mass, right? So if we like put this into words, then you would say something like, the mass is um, the amount an object sort of resists linear motion given an applied force. Resistance, boy, spelling is hard. Okay, it just seems like a nice easy definition in the mechanics word you know in the mechanics way of it of mass how much am i resisting some certain acceleration given an applied force so if you thought thought about having a block on your river that's made of steel versus a block on your river that's made of i don't know feathers <laughs> it's, it's a goose i don't know you silly goose um you apply the same force to both objects obviously the steel is going to accelerate much less than the feathers or the goose, whatever. Um, that's because it has less mass. So that would be one way to sort of think about it. And this leads into a similar analogy for mass moment of inertia. So now let's consider the same box. With a torque applied. And torque, we might consider like a moment, all right? Moment, torque, kind of exchangeable ideas, interchangeable ideas, I guess is the right way to say it. So here's our box now. 
And let's say now we're looking at our box from above and it's you know sort of sitting on this ice. And the ice is sort of below the box in this picture, sort of like on the bottom of the plane. If we apply a moment to this particular guy, force here and a force here, this is going to generate for us some moment. Given some, let's give some position vector here to this particular force, which is the position vector R. With our general formula of F equals MA, we can make an analogy here by taking the cross product of this whole formula with that position vector to give us a moment on the left-hand side and something else on the right-hand side. So take cross product. with the position vector R, and you'll get something like position vector R crossed with the force is equal to the position vector R crossed with the mass times acceleration, right? So we can identify this left-hand side here as a moment that we're applying. Hopefully you can kind of identify that from statics. And the right-hand side is a little bit more suspicious, and we will talk more about it later in this class. You'll specifically talk a lot about it in 2003 when you get to rigid bodies. But the right hand side, this is I times alpha. And so let's uh, make this a little bit clearer. And let's define what each of these is. So here is your moment that's applied. This, not A, Kevin, alpha, fish. This is your angular acceleration. And this term I here is your mass moment of inertia. This here, M is I alpha, is the angular analogy for Newton's second law in linear form. <clears throat> All right. So you're just taking basically the cross product of this with the position vector on both sides, and that gives you this like angular analogy. You've seen the angular analogy sort of of a force in your statics class, which is the moment. You've maybe not seen the angular analogy of a linear acceleration yet. We're going to get there. And that's the angular acceleration. And that is, this equation is basically telling us if I put a torque, or I put a moment on a thing, how much is it going to spin up with some angular acceleration with the resistance that that object has to that angular acceleration being the mass moment of inertia, this capital I. So it has this like linear to angular analogy where we think about the mass being the resistance to linear acceleration giving a linear applied force, where the mass moment of inertia is the resistance of an object to angular acceleration given an applied torque, All right? That's the idea that we have here. So if we go back to our picture, we're gonna have this force and this is gonna cause it to spin up here with I alpha, all right? For spinning on the ice, give it a torque. It's going to spin up with I alpha. That's the kinetic component of what you see there. Much like MA was the kinetic component of what you saw above for the linear motion. Okay, so we would rearrange here. And get something like this mass moment of inertia I, which is the same variable as area moment of inertia for reasons that, I don't know, I didn't come up with this variable. The knowing that they're you know the same variable to me but it's okay um this is going to be the applied moment or the applied torque normalized by the angular acceleration alpha so in words the mass moment of inertia
is the resistance. of an object to angular acceleration given an applied torque. Or moment. Torque and moment kind of interchangeable ideas here. OK, so hopefully we all kind of like understand the analogy here. And so think about the figure skater. You know, the figure skater is got some angular momentum or angular motion. And she can change her mass moment of inertia by bringing in her arms and the same applied torque or the same applied energy that's happening. You're lowering your resistance to angular acceleration with the same sort of applied torque or moment, right? So by lowering the value of I, you can increase your angular acceleration or angular speed, right? So there you go. That's the general idea. So there's your introduction. Cool. Now, uh, how do we calculate that? OK. <clears throat> um, let's be very clear here. I want to make one final note. The mass moment of inertia An area moment of inertia are not the same. OK, I'm going to say this like 50 times, but I'm going to ask you to calculate an area moment of inertia on the test, and someone's going to give me a mass moment of inertia. And when they get their chest back, they're going to cry. All right. So mass moment inertia, area moment inertia, not the same. All right. The area moment of inertia has units of like length to the fourth. All right. And we will see that the mass moment of inertia has units that's something like mass times length squared. OK. So how do we go about calculating this or how do we go about like utilizing this idea or figuring out what the mass moment of inertia is for a particular body? Well, you can probably see even by this analogy that I've had on the front end that mass is going to be an important part of this. OK, with our linear analogy, a lot of mass, you have more resistance to linear motion given the same applied force in our angular analogy. You have more resistance to angular motion with the same applied torque. And mass will be an important part of that limitation. So let's see how this actually goes and let's see how this actually gets derived. So let's do a derivation of mass moment of inertia for arbitrary body. All right. So before we move to a full body, we'll start with a, a differential element. And then once we figure out what's the mass moment of inertia of that little individual element or that little individual bit, we'll sum its contribution over the whole body with some integral. And that will be how we proceed. All right. So let's think of or consider a differential mass. of mass dm and let's say, say it's mounted on a rod of negligible mass Located away from an axis of rotation. Uh, 
um, some distance, which is little r. A distance, little r. All right, so let's um, draw a picture of this bad boy. All right, so we've got some axis of rotation. Let's call it AA prime, not to be confused with AA Ron. <laughs> oh man, sometimes. <laughs> All right, we've got a, a differential mass, dm, mounted on a rod of negligible mass located away from an axis of rotation. All right, so here's our axis of rotation A. We've got some mass that exists out in space here. I don't know, let's use green because green is, is cool. And here's our differential mass dm. It's, it's mounted on a rod of negligible mass that exists between that axis of rotation and that particular mass. And we're calling this distance here, which is a little r. Here, this is perpendicular to this axis. Just to be clear, it's the shortest distance that exists between these two guys. It's a parallel distance, perpendicular distance. All right. Now, let's assume that we're going to spin this up. All right, because I'm interested in what is the response of this general system once I spin it up? All right, so let's put some applied torque on this guy. And let's spin this up with some torque T. Well, you can go in the lab and you can measure this. And if you were in the lab, you would find that the amount of resistance that you would have to that applied torque, given your little differential mass dm, goes with the square of the distance that that mass has away from that axis of rotation. Okay, So the further that mass is away from that center axis of rotation, the harder it is to spin that thing by a factor of one square. Okay, So you can find that the angular acceleration of object about a a prime so of dm about a a prime goes as um 1 over R squared. Well, actually, it's R squared direct. It's direct relationship. So it's got this proportionality R squared. Right. Okay. So this resistance to acceleration angularly can just be defined as that little differential mass multiplied by the distance that that mass is away from that axis squared. Let's call it di, the differential mass moment of inertia, is something like this distance that it is away from the axis squared times the differential mass dm. Maybe we should be specific that this is about a a prime. Can include that or not. Now the idea is a solid rigid body, a full 3D body, would have infinitely many points of these tiny masses. And the idea is we could add up all the contributions of all those little masses to get actually the full mass moment of inertia of a full body. And so that's what we're going to do. For a full body, some contributions of all mass elements. Okay, so a picture you should have in your head. Here's a a prime. And now we've got sort of this full three-dimensional body. I don't, I'll do my best 
Mechanics potato. <laughs> okay. Imagine that's a 3D object. I know, very suspicious. <clears throat> and this is obviously made up of many differential masses. You can call this maybe DMI. And this is at a location of RI, let's say. And I want to sum the contributions of all of those little guys. And all of those little guys are at locations RI, you know, changing with each individual element away from that axis a a prime and so the idea is the masses that are very close to that center of rotation we don't weigh very heavily because they're very close to the center of that axis of rotation so spinning something with a lot of mass right about the axis you're rotating is very easy i mean you could try that with that water bottle that kenzie has right in the back there if you want to spin that water bottle along its long axis it's pretty easy to do so you want to spin that water bottle about an axis that's passing through the middle of that bottle, it's a lot harder to do. And that's because you'd have a lot of mass very far away from that axis of rotation. Okay. And so summing the contributions, you'll see that the farther away these differential elements are from the axis of rotation, the more of an effect they would have on the mass moment of inertia, which is exactly why the ice skater, when she brings her leg in closer to the axis of rotation, will speed up. All right. So finally, We can define this as the mass moment of inertia of this object about axis a a prime is the summation of all these individual contributions, which is r squared dm over the mass m. All right. Mass integral. Man, we have not seen these yet. It's a new venture. You've seen area integrals. Now we see a mass integral. Uh oh. Are you are you scared? I'm scared. How do we actually utilize this? Give us a box, it's important. All right. So in rectangular components. So we'll say in rectangular coordinate system. All right, let's give ourselves a rectangular coordinate system and kind of try to interpret what's going on here. And I've got my object. Okay, <laughs> taking up some space there. <laughs> Beautiful 3D object, my mechanics potato. And I have my differential mass here out in space. Okay. Let's say I'm interested in the area moment of inertia of this particular object about the y axis. All right. So. Sorry, not area moment, mass. Y axis. All right, well, if I wanted to do that and I thought about the previous definition I just wrote on the board, I would define myself a distance from the Y axis to that element DM as the variable R, right? Okay, so we can do that. This is my variable here, R. All right. <clears throat> well, if I wanted this in sort of rectangular components, uh, I could just project what R is down to the XZ plane and write R in terms of X and Z. So let me project this down here. This is more or less the same magnitude, this vector R. But now I can see that it has components in X and Y, or sorry, X and Z, which are pretty easy to identify. So here, this is X, here, this is Z. And here we let this R squared equals X squared plus Z squared, Pythagorean theory, right? All 
So then any differential element dm located at position r could be represented not by that value of r, but by values of x and z, which, you know, we're just generally more comfortable working with, you know, x, y, z coordinates. So then if I wanted like the area moment of inertia i, y, that would be the integral on the mass of this r squared dm. But if specifically I'm interested in, you know, this y axis, I could represent r in terms of components x and z. And since this is r squared, it's kind of nice that we could just represent this as the integral in the mass x squared plus z squared. dm All right so if we're working in rectangular components this is kind of a nice place for us to start with our integration All right. so here we are for um integration about the y uh air, mass moment of inertia about the y-axis you could do a very similar thing for like the x-axis all right, my distance between this point and the x-axis could be defined by like this r, which would have components of z and y, right? And so you could label that r as like square root of z squared plus y squared. And the same sort of derivation that we just did for mass moment of inertia about the y-axis would look the same, except this x squared plus z squared would be replaced with y squared plus z squared. So let's put this into summary. If you want the mass moments of inertia about these various axes in rectangular components, which is, you know, probably the most comfortable working space for us, about the x-axis is going to be y squared plus z squared. dm. About the, the y-axis is the integral on the mass of x squared plus z squared integrated over the mass and the mass moment of inertia about the z-axis is the integral on the mass of x squared plus y squared all using just like this pythagorean idea to define the location of these differential masses in space using our rectangular coordinates all right so this is a nice um, boxable set of equations. Put it in a box. Like Justin Timberlake. <laughs> uh, just kidding. All right. Now, let's talk about this uh, scary looking integral. Because most of you probably haven't seen mass integrals before. And daunting. All right. What does it mean to be an integral on a mass of something? Like, it's what, what does that even mean? We've really only talked about like single integrals in one direction, right? So single integral in x, okay, dx, okay, I can do that. An area integral, it's a little shaky, but we did that over the last week, it's fine. What is this like mass integral nonsense? All right, well, let's talk about it. working with these like mass integrals or more technically speaking integrals over the mass of the body it's actually really difficult to evaluate a mass integral directly and usually the easiest way around this is to convert the mass integral into a volume integral through the density right convert to volume integral through density. All right. You know from your physics class or 
even maybe your like high school classes. That if an object has a constant density throughout its whole volume, which is pretty much what we're going to work with in this class. For objects with constant density. Um, you might see this as a homogeneous material. It's not technically the definition of a hom homogeneous material, but it's pretty close. For all intents and purposes in this class, it's probably fine. So for an object with a constant density, then um, we would say that the mass of that object is just the density of that object times the volume of that object. Pretty simple. Right. Something you learn in one of your basic classes. And if the density is sort of like remaining constant over the whole volume, then each differential element, tiny element in space, could be represented in the same way as well. Each differential mass is the density of the object, whatever it is, consistent through the thickness, multiplied by the differential volume that exists at that location. Okay, so we could take this to the differential if our density is constant. And you could write that like the differential mass is equal to the density, which is constant at all locations, times the differential volume. And this is how we convert from generally a mass integral to a volume integral. So then something like Ix, which we saw before as the integral on the mass of y squared plus z squared dm might convert to the integral on the mass of, not integral on the mass, but integral on the volume of y squared plus z squared rho dv. All right converting from a differential mass integration to a differential volume integration. So we talked about area integrals, which are two dimensional integrals. Volume integrals are triple integrals, all right? So don't be scared, okay? Triple integrals, we're doing them, all right? You're gonna learn to like it. And you already know how to do it. It's just one additional step in one additional dimension. So you can do it, all right? And let's show you how you might end up doing this, all right? Where in rectangular components, my differential volume, dv can be expressed as what? How do we express our differential area element? So uh, in differential form, you know, I'm looking at a very specific point on a structure. If I want to go from an aerial integral, I want to convert from dA to dx dy or dy dx, right? So here we can represent our volume integral as something like dV is dx dy dz or any rearrangement of this concept, right? Depending on how you might want to proceed with your integration. You know, if we're doing triple integrals, we're again going to integrate from like the inside out. And so we may want to rearrange dv as dx dy dz or dx dz dy or dz dy dx or whatever. Whatever makes our integration the easiest, our life the easiest, that's probably how we're going to want to go with it. All right. So in rectangular components, this is a representation of your differential volume. Um, I'll give you the representation in cylindrical components.
PV here is represented as R, dr, d theta, <laughs> dz. A pirate's favorite representation, dr. <laughs> oh, terrible. <laughs> I got a comment in Teams. Maybe I, hopefully I'm not too late. Ah, Danya's on the ball. DX, DY, DZ. Good job. All right. So if we take this into consideration, um, these two ideas or these two definitions of our differential volume, we can represent our mass moment of inertia integral in what is probably the most common form that you can see. And we'll do that now. So can represent. Mass moment of inertia integrals. In most common form. And this is usually the form that you'll see if you sort of open up any like engineering book or any textbook. The, probably the most common that you'll see is that let's take the mass moment of inertia about let's say the x-axis will be the integral on the volume of y squared plus z squared times rho dv or you might express dv as dx dy dz or whatever you want about the y-axis, volume integral, x squared plus z squared, rho dv. And finally, about the z-axis. Seems a little redundant, but good to get them all down here. Integral on the volume, x squared plus y squared. OK, baby. Looking good. Triple integrals. Get your math pants on. It's funny, I say that in a lot of my classes. And a student that I've had now for five classes, he's going to sign up for a sixth class with me in the spring. He's still not sick of me yet. He got for me a Christmas gift that was like a pair of sweatpants that has all these math formulas on it. And he said, I got you some math pants for Christmas. <laughs> so maybe one of these days I'll wear those to lecture and we can all have a good laugh. Maybe I should have worn them today because we're doing triple integrals, man. It seems like just as good a day as any. <laughs> oh, he says we have to postpone learning triple integrals then. Incorrect. Every day I have my math pants on. OK, so we've done a lot of talky talky. Let's do an example. Let's put this to, to, to try, to use. No more talky talky. Time for worky worky. All right, let's do an example. And basically, like the most simplistic object that we could kind of think of, just like a sort of a rectangular prism. So I'll pull this up and give you a second to copy down. And we'll we'll work through it. All right. Homogeneous rectangular prism. We want to determine by direct integration the moments of inertia with respect to the z-axis and respect to the x-axis. Notice here that the x-axis is like right in the middle of the cross section there, okay?
doing a triple. Rawr. Bet when you woke up this morning, you didn't think you'd be doing a triple integral. Bet. And if you did, man, you you deserve to like be on the psychic network. <laughs> I didn't even have these notes posted until like late this morning. Just hit the alarm clock. Man, I think I'm gonna do a triple integral today. It should be on like Geraldo or something. All right. Away we go. All right, so find mass moment of inertia. And we're basically going to know that IY is IZ. Um, symmetrical here is pretty sort of pretty obvious to tell. Um, assuming A is equal to B. Kind of making that assumption here, okay? But we'll just uh, we'll just run through it with uh, A and B as separate variables. Okay, so let's do this. Um, my general formula is going to look something like I is the integral on the mass of R squared dm, right? So let's convert that dm into a, something that we can actually work with. So we'll let dm is rho dv. We're told that the density is constant in this piece. It was told it's a homogeneous rectangular prism. This is going to be just started as rho dx dy dz. So let's start with uh, start with IZ. That's what they ask us for first in the problem. So first, IZ. The mass moment of inertia equation. The integral in the volume of x squared plus y squared rho dv, which we're writing as rho dx dy dz. So just like with the double integrals, I think probably the most difficult thing we have to consider here is setting up our boundaries. The rest is pretty straightforward. So with the triple integral, we're gonna go through three integrations here. Outside in as, no, as usual. Sorry, inside out, whatever. I got to think about my bounds on this interior integral. I'm going to first integrate with respect to x. Right. It's my first interior integral here. Anyone want to give some candidate ideas of my bounds on this integral? In the x direction. Zero to a, good. So if I considered some differential volume element that existed in here. Do my best to draw a tiny little element there. I'm doing dx dy dz. So I'm first going to create like something along x by sort of integrating along this direction first. Right? So it's sort of like uh, long rectangular prisms uh, that have a cross section of dy by dz. And so when I think about what are the bounds going to be, if I were going to like expand in that x direction, I would run into sort of this left hand bound of this guy uh, at x equals zero and the right hand bound of this guy at x equals a. So my limits of my integration here for x, x equals zero, x equals a. Right. 
So after I do that, like I said, I have these like rectangular prisms that are inside my piece. They're sort of ready to be, you know, expanded again. Right. <clears throat> now I have to worry about uh, sort of the next level of my integral, which is going to be the integration with respect to y. Anyone want to try candidate limits on um, integration in the y direction? Negative b on 2 to b on 2. Good. So we see that uh, the x-axis is kind of like splitting, or it's like right in the middle of that cross-section. So uh, we're going to go with our little rectangles here just in this general direction. So now I'm going to make for myself little plates that are of thickness uh, dz. And I'm going to sort of expand these rectangular prisms up and down until I run into the boundary in y now. And so that's going to go from negative b on 2 to b on 2. And very similar reasoning. Uh, once I've sort of created my plates by integrating in that second direction, now I've got to integrate sort of in this third direction by stacking all those plates and moving them sort of into and out of the z direction. And when I do that, my boundaries on that sort of work is going to utilize this variable C here. And again, my X axis is like splitting that C in half. So I'm going to integrate on the Z direction from negative C on two to positive C on two. Nothing to it. Nothing C on to it. We have a question, are we ever going to be asked about problems where the axes are not necessarily clear? Yeah. Yeah, so the comment here is that there's no specific way for us to know that it's sort of piercing the center here. Um, I guess I'd be very clear on the test. Um, we're asking for more clarity. But this is your integration, and here we are. And this really isn't that bad when you just break it up into its various pieces. So we'll just go with this guy first and work our way through it. All right, so let's do it. In this particular example, uh, it's kind of nice because we don't have any like functional dependence with x on y or y on x or anything like that. So you don't have to worry about any functional dependence of one variable with relation to the integration of another because there really is no relationship here between the variables. So that's kind of a nice... Um, part of this particular problem. So we'll go through uh, this guy. Negative C on 2. C on 2. Negative B on 2 to B on 2. And now I'm going to integrate this interior, interior bit with respect to x. So I'm leaving y alone. I'm treating it as a constant at this particular point because y is not a function of x in this problem. So here we're going to end up with x cubed on 3 plus xy squared. I'm treating y as a constant, okay? Evaluated between 0 and a. And still retaining my rho dy dz on the back end. We're going to plug in just like we typically do in your calculus class. A cubed on 3 plus AY squared. And then all my nonsense on the back side still. Okay. Now I'm ready for my integration with respect to Y. Here we'll end up with a cubed y on 3. Okay, a cubed on 3 is a constant value. Plus 
a y cubed on three. So again, a is a constant. The integral of y squared with respect to y is y cubed on three. Evaluating between negative b on two and b on two. Okay, there's a couple of ways to sort of do this. Um, recognize that these are both odd functions. We're integrating odd functions. That means that we could go from like, we could change these bounds if we wanted to like zero to be on two and then multiply that whole thing by two. That would be appropriate. There are many ways to sort of like handle this. Um, I guess we could just go directly here and um, My evaluation here, I'll just give it to you. You can sort of work this out if you wanted. A cubed B on six. Here we're gonna have plus. A B cubed on 24. This kind of keeping track of constants here. It's a little bit tedious because we have the halves that are sort of floating around. If you wanted to make this problem a little bit easier, you could make some substitution that's like B on two is some other stand-in variable and then plug in at the very end. It might help your situation. We'll just go through as is for now. All right, maybe it's about time to start pulling out things that are constant. So I could pull out this two in this row. Let's do that. Might as well integrate with respect to z while we're at it. We don't have any um, z variables in here. So it's going to be something like uh, a cubed b z over 6 plus a b cubed z over 24 evaluated between z as negative c on two and c on two. Okay. This two, uh, some things are going to cancel here. So, uh, be a bit nice when I sort of plug in here for Z. Um, yeah, let's just go. Let's just go with it directly here. So it's A cubed B C. I'm just sort of pulling out some variables here after um, plugging in for my C and C on two. I'll sort of get that evaluation. This is uh, your final answer, but it looks a bit of a mess, yeah? Remember I said that your units for area moments of inertia usually are something like mass times length squared, yes? Here we have something like density times length to the fifth. That's annoying. All right. So is there some other way that we could represent this that might be a little bit nicer? Looks like I have a question here. Where'd I get the four from? I'm sort of just rearranging the constants. Uh, it's just, uh, I'm going from this step to this step sort of without showing a bunch of the algebra. I'm pulling information out, yes.
Oh, sorry. Yep, this should just this should not be here. Thank you. Sorry about that. And this usually comes up in a lot of these mass moment of inertia problems is how do I go from what looks like a density plus a bunch of nonsense here to something that makes a little bit more sense? And the answer is understanding that there is a relationship between the mass and the density, right? So here, we know that the mass of this object is rho times the volume of this object, yes? And generally, what is the volume of this rectangular prism? In terms of variables, we know. Yeah, A times B times C. Okay, so the mass here is rho ABC. Easy as rho one, two, three, exactly. <laughs> or rho do, me, do re me, if you like. Okay. We can make this substitution then. All right, each one of these terms has an ABC. We have an ABC here. We have a rho that kind of connects to both. So you can sort of whittle this down with this information in mind here and actually write this not in terms of the density and some built-in volume that exists in all these particular places, but you could just make that substitution directly so that you can get to something that looks like math, mass times length squared. So after the substitution, you end up with pulling out some constants here, m on 12, 4a squared plus b squared. And that's just sort of uh, pulling out some values, pulling out some numbers along the way there. You could go to any table that has listings of mass moments inertia and you could find this formula. I think I actually include one in your, yeah, here. So here's a, comes a little bit later in your, um, oh yeah, but that's, uh, never mind because this was, this has got the axes right in the center. So we'll talk about how to parallel axis theorem for mass moment of inertia later. Okay, you get the general idea there. Okay, but that's more or less how this, this works. Set up a triple integral, very similar to double integrals, make your way through, Simplify some things along the way, and, and sort of there you go. All right. Uh, I will leave it there. I would say if you want a challenge, if you want to give IX a try, we have the same general idea. Right. Let's set up the integration. Going to look very similar. And our limits are more or less exactly the same except we have different variables of integration on the inside. So x going from 0 to a, y from negative b on 2 to b on 2, and z going from negative c on 2 to c on 2. You want to challenge yourself and sort of give this guy a go on your own. You can work through this. And as you might read in some textbooks, it is trivial to show that to be true. Yes, sir.
the question is, would we be asked to do this kind of integration on a test? Yeah, maybe. You got two hours, man. I got to do something. <laughs> OK, uh, so we'll leave it there for today. Um, I did post the area moment of inertia homework over the break time, so that is posted. I'll be due on Tuesday when you get back. Other than that, have a nice break. Die Hard is a Christmas movie. <laughs> have a nice break, Professor.